Hello. Hello, Jacqueline. You're one of the speakers, right? Hi, yeah, Hi. that's me. Do you want to try sharing your screen? Um, okay. Okay, it says host disabled participant. Oh, 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 oh wait a minute, uh, that's no, okay. Make co-host, you should be able to do it now. Let me try. Mm, just give me a minute. Yeah, I can do it now. Okay, great, great. Do you want me to share right now? Or did you just want me to check? I just wanted to make sure that it worked. Thank you. Have you decided which order there are there three of you presenting? Right. Or, yeah. So, have so you decided um, in what order? yeah, Kitty would be starting, and then uh, after that, it's me, and then Logan. So okay. when she joins, she's going to share her screen first. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. She's not here yet. Yeah. Our previous meetings were starting right on time because they did not allow the participants to join first. So I think. That's the understanding. Okay. Yeah. Are you actually at UTSC or UTM or? One of the other campuses. So yeah, are you asking me? Yes. Which campus are you are you at? From Oise. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So you're downtown. Yes, St. George mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not actually St. George, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Not just St. George, it's the Oise thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Waiting for Kitty, who is the first speaker, to sign on. Oh, Kitty, you're here. Uh, hi, you're the first. You're the first speaker. Uh, let me let me give you host privileges. 
Hi, Margaret. <laughs> Hi, Jeffrey. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for coming. Kitty, do you want to try sharing your screen? Uh, yes, uh, I will need to do that. And Logan, I don't think he's here yet. Logan yeah. Martin and uh, Jacqueline. Yeah, uh, uh, Jacqueline already did this. Okay. So I made you co-host. So can you try sharing your screen? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna try anyways. Not this. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Yes, I can see it. That's good. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna leave leave it like that. Uh, so I I know we uh, we need to wait for like five minutes so that students are settled. Then we start at two o five. Is that right? Uh, that should that should be that should be good. Except uh, okay. Jacqueline said that said that there had been some advice to start immediately. Uh, what, was, what was the reason for that? I uh, that's the, that? that's yeah. Parker told me that. Uh, or okay. it is like it is written on the website to say we start at because some students might be late. Um, unless it's okay. I don't. I don't. I don't mind if we lose five minutes. Okay. Uh, and is that okay? We do that. Yeah. You mean okay. you want to start? You want to start right now? Uh, I should stop the recording because yeah. now it's uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Let's give it to five minutes. Uh, okay, all right, if you prefer. Yeah. Wait, somebody's. I am playing the, the okay. music. All right. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay. It's a good, it's a good way to get them mentally ready. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Issue with uh, oh, microphone. Oh, oh um, yeah. I I just want to see if it's still muffled because the meeting earlier today it was okay. hard to hear. 
It's okay. good. It's good. It's fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Time. Uh, okay. Is the organizer have something to say? Yes, uh, I was just going to introduce the three speakers Kitty, Jan, Jacqueline, Anand, and Logan Murphy, who will speak on peer improvers. So go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so let me first uh, welcome you to the uh, seminar series. It's a great pleasure to meet all of you at this undergrad seminar event. Uh, we're excited to share with you what we know about the Lean Theorem Prover, uh, and we look forward to working with you today, next week, and hopefully in the next semester. Uh, it will be lots of fun. Uh, before we get started, uh, a little introduction about ourselves. Uh, here we are. Uh, Professor Gila Hanna is the lead of the research team. My name's Kitty. Please meet Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first session of Lean Seminar Series. And meet Logan. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, the, so the three of us will be speaking about different aspects of the topic. And we're here to help you while you're working uh, with uh, Lean or proving with the Lean Theorem Prover. So this is what we're going to do for this session. First, uh, Logan will give you a brief introduction to Lean by demonstrating how a simple proof can be proved in the system. In order to work with Lean, we need some preparations. This includes solving logical puzzles, getting familiar with quantifiers, and doing some translations with uh, quantifiers. Then Jeplin will walk you through piano axioms, which are extremely important for the natural number game that we're going to play. So without further ado, let's welcome Logan to kick off. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to what Lean is and, and why uh, we want to talk about it today. Um, so Lean is a proof assistant. Um, now, I know there's, I think there's some people here that are already part of sort of the theorem proving community, but for those uh, who don't know what proof assistants are for, um, uh, it's, it's an interactive theorem prover. So it's an environment for specifying formal proofs uh, and for checking the correctness of, of proofs. Uh, and it also provides some degree of automation um, to, to help the proving process come along. Um, yes, thank you, Kitty. Uh, there should be some more. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and then uh, an example here on the slide you should see is just an example of what a simple uh, proof in Lean looks like. Um, this is just a basic theorem saying that if a natural number is even, then uh, that number mod 2 is 0. Uh, and so you see the theorem statement at the top, and then uh, the body of the proof is a series of instructions uh, provided to the software to uh, basically instruct on how to complete a, a proof of the theorem. 
Um, now, when we talk about proofs and lean, um, we usually talk about a sort of formalizing or formal proof. And this sort of contrast with the kind of informal, informal proof that most mathematicians usually deal with. So um, on the left here, you see an example of a basic proof of a simple proposition from some group theory textbook. Um, and there is some formality here. You know, you have symbols and manipulations. Um, but it's, uh, it's presented in natural language, and the reader is meant to infer a lot of sort of the underlying reasoning happening uh, within the proof. On the right here is uh, what you'd usually recognize as a, as a strictly formal proof. This is sort of like a Fitch style proof, um, where every line of the proof is a logical sentence um, in a strictly formal language, uh, and the, the sentences are connected by um, uh, explicit reference to inference rules or previous lines and definitions and, and rules of reasoning. So this is sort of the contrast that we try to make between an informal proof or a semi-formal proof and a fully formal proof. And of course, the principle uh, underlying, you know, modern mathematics is that in, in, in principle, proofs can be simplified to these sort of logical inferences. But of course, this doesn't scale to the kind of mathematics that, that mathematicians use. Um, and so that's where, where lean comes in. Lean is sort of a way to help you formalize your proofs to this level of specificity um, while providing a more user-friendly experience. At least that's the way that I kind of look at, at what lean is for. Um, so mathematicians have been around for a lot longer than proof assistants. So the question actually comes up of why should mathematicians be interested in using proof assistants? Um, and there's, uh, so I'm not a mathematician, but uh, mathematicians uh, have spoken on this. And one that's been quite vocal about it is Kevin Buzzer from Imperial College London. Um, and his, his argument is uh, uh, sort of saying, um, you know, the, the, the proof checking process for, for, you know, the kind of advanced mathematics that, that's being done nowadays is, is pretty uh, labor and time and energy intensive. And, you know, if mathematics wants to maintain its sort of stature, at, you know, its pedigree at the top of the sciences, um, sort of the, any, any sort of doubt that, that the theorems of mathematicians are using as part of their proofs might, might not be entirely correct um, is really, you know, it's, it's really not, uh, uh, not satisfactory. Um, and so he's, he's been one of the mathematicians who are very actively trying to promote the use of tools like lean uh, by mathematicians. Um, and so we've seen, uh, you know, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, uh, proof assistants like Lean have been used in mathematics classrooms uh, to teach or assess mathematics. Um, I think we have a list of a couple of ones here. It's not a totally exhaustive list, um, but uh, uh, it's been sort of, uh, from our, our experience, been limited in sort of the mathematics education world uh, in Canada. Um, and sort of that's part of why we're doing this seminar series. We want to promote the use of, of this kind of software in, in, uh, for mathematics students and, and mathematics educators. Um, and if you're interested in sort of the role of proof technology in, in math uh, research and teaching, um, there's a, a book that one of our um, uh, professor, uh, our, our principal investigator of this, of this team uh, was editing, um, and it had a lot of uh, interesting contributions from, from mathematicians uh, who are interested in, in exactly this sort of this sort of phenomenon. Um, yeah, so so uh, lean is not the only proof assistant uh, of its kind, and, and you know uh, the computer science community has been building these things for for decades. Um, but there are a few reasons why we're particularly interested in lean. One is that it's pretty new; it's only about seven or eight years old. Um, so that means that it's been able to learn some of the the design lessons from previous theorem proving software. Um, that's, uh, I think, has made it more uh, sort of accessible to people who don't have theorem proving experience, which is always good. Um, another reason is that uh, Lean has seen a lot of uh, sort of excitement and interest from the mathematics community. Um, so theorem provers have always been of interest to uh, computer scientists and mathematical logicians, but it's always been kind of hard for, uh, you know, uh, actual mathematicians to, uh, uh, or, or other kinds of mathematicians to, to use them for formalizing their kind of mathematics. And uh, one thing we've seen with Lean is a very vibrant and active community of, of mathematicians who otherwise weren't really big into sort of theorem proving or, or that kind of stuff, use it for, for formalizing some of their work. Um, and it has a really active community. Um, it has a really welcoming uh, chat room on the Zulip chat. If you look up the Lean community website, you'll find all sorts of helpful links to it. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite accessible for beginners. So for that reason, I, I think it's a, it's a great place for people who are interested in formalizing mathematics to, to sort of start looking into it. Um, so I think, Kitty, I'll just do a quick demonstration of what it looks like to use Lean interactively, if that's okay. Yes, let me stop share. Thank you. Great. 
Okay, um, so this is a, a simple example of what using Lean interactively looks like. So I've loaded Lean, or I've loaded my um, uh, Visual Studio Code editor, and I have Lean installed, and there's a Lean extension that helps uh, you, you use the software. Um, and uh, here I have two examples of, of very simple theorems about natural numbers. This one just says that uh, any number plus itself plus zero is itself. Uh, and this one just has to do with the uh, you know, manipulations of the successor function. But as you can see, when I put my cursor at the start of the proof, I get this little display and the, the, the text editor that shows um, you know, to the right of the turnstile here is the theorem that I'm trying to prove. And everything above are sort of things that are known. So this could be, in this case, it's just that N and M are two natural numbers. But if I had additional uh, hypotheses or premises in my proof, uh, then these would also be displayed above the turnstile here. And like I said, the body of the proof is essentially a series of instructions on how the system can complete a proof term that, that resolves this obligation. Um, so in this instance, I can tell the system to proceed by induction on M and I can name my induction hypothesis. Uh, and then I get uh, two resulting proof goals now, one for the base case and for the inductive case. Uh, and I can proceed by using these other instructions that, that uh, eventually resolve the proof. And you can see here, like when I go to the inductive case, my inductive hypothesis has been added to my proof context. Um, the, 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 the specifics here are not really important. I just wanted you to get a feel of what it looks like to use Lean interactively. Um, now with that, I think we'll continue with the rest of the slides. Um, bef before we start uh, using Lean more intensely, we just have to cover a bit of other things to sort of get the sort of toolbox that we need to, to play the natural number game. So um, now uh, let's move on to a logical puzzle that we need to solve. So I just dropped a, the handout for this session in the chat. Uh, you may want to open the file because you will need it to solve this puzzle. So it's called Melise and Alice. Uh, so you, the detective, is going to solve it. Uh, the detail of the story is in the handout. Uh, I will give you a moment to open the file. So make sure you have it right in front of you. So once you have it open, uh, look at the first section and you will see a list of facts or conditions that helps uh, that helps you to figure out who is the victim uh, and who's the who's the killer so now this is what we're gonna do all you detectives will work on the puzzle individually for a few minutes if you finish uh, please raise your hand using the uh, reaction feature on zoom so that we know uh, for those who finish early, if you're really fast, uh, you uh, and you want you want to solve more similar games, you can find an, another puzzle in the further uh, practice section at the very back of the, the handout. So there's more uh, for you to do. Uh, so let's start now. Uh, we will spend uh, a few minutes on this puzzle. Uh, I will turn on some music as you are solving it, then we will all come back. Okay, that's the plan. Emailing the document is in the chat. I will put the list in the chat as well. Just give me. But I think people who are on using the phone can can't open it from his iPad. Let, let me try to do that. If you're sharing your screen, it's okay. That's fine. Oh, okay. It's all in the chat. Okay.
Okay. Uh, did anyone get the solution? I don't see anyone raise a hand. Maybe you did. You just didn't want to share. Uh, uh, Mary had a solution. Could you share? Could you share your thoughts with us? Just, just uh, first tell us who do you think was the victim, who was the murder, and how did you arrive at the solution? Uh, Mary, please. Yeah. So I think the father was the victim, and one of the children was the killer. <laughs> okay, and how did you arrive at that solution? Uh, so we know that there are five people and that the children uh, cannot be together. Mm -hmm. So that tells me there's a child on the beach. Uh, we're told that there's Alice and a male in the bar. So then uh, Alice and her husband or brother-in-law are in the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, we're told that the victim is the killer is younger than the victim so that makes the, the victim sorry what make the kids killers that makes the kid a killer yeah. and right. then we were told something about uh the twin so uh yeah. the, the, the twin yeah, must go ahead yeah let's unpack the twin how did you understand that condition the, which condition the, the victim's twin is innocent, right? Basically, that's what's given. How did you understand that? Yeah, that was a bit of a leap because <laughs> it could be that the uh, the, the children are uh, identical, are, are fraternal twins, and um, yeah, that's one possibility. You are right. Uh, and uh, from the picture, they the the children appeared to be different ages, and also the yeah oh yeah the picture uh, is I I selected <laughs> a picture randomly, so that's a little misleading. I okay. think yeah I think for the critical point, uh, you know, in the list, I think the the number five, the victim's uh, twin is so. That, that's, that's saying the victim has a twin. Right. And the twin has to be in this group of five. That's the, the understanding we need to develop from that particular yeah. condition. So from there, then if you're saying the killer is this, the one of the kid, um, so the kid, if the killer is one of the kid and so the twin, there, there, are two, there are two possibilities. The two kids are twins, and right. then Alice and her brother are twins. That's the only possibility, right? Right, but then that got me into the uh, younger. Normally people wouldn't say that, I don't know. I mean, certainly one twin comes out before the other twin. <laughs> and so in principle, it, it could be that anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> I didn't you. Feel like the kids were twins. Yeah. Thank you for for sharing your thoughts. Thoughts. I don't. I don't want to reveal the um, the solution yet. Let's let's do that at the end of the session. Let's so I want. River has. <laughs> uh, I I want to say a little bit about like this type of puzzle. What what's the purpose of solving it? So a special feature of logical puzzles like this one is that you're or we are respect, uh, expected to have a systematic search through all possible states of affairs so that one given condition doesn't contradict another. Since all possibilities are finite in this situation or in this context, eventually this search would get you uh, the right answer. And in this process, you have to use some of the key logical terms such as and, or, if, then, not, so that's the purpose of doing this. Uh, I will review the answer at the end of the, uh, uh, the session. Uh, hopefully yeah, you'll get some time to, to re rethink of it. Uh, then hopefully we'll agree on the solution at the end. Is it possible that the bar is on the beach? 
No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, there's a different okay. location. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one location is the beach, the other is the bar, and okay. then the okay. one kid is around somewhere. Okay. Thanks. So let's uh, now let's move on to uh, quantifiers. What are quantifiers? Uh, some of you may know them very well. So in normal use or in everyday language, quantifiers are determiners. We could say all students at U of T have a T card. Uh, we could say some students in the math department very much enjoy programming. So these quantifiers specify the number or amount of something. In mathematics, quantifiers is used to refer to the two extremes for all, and there is at least one. They are the two uh, language constructions that are fundamental to expressing and proving mathematical facts. And in fact, the majority of mathematical theorems will have one of the two forms. So, Universal quantifier means for all. The symbol here is an upside down A, letter A. For example, if I want to say the square of any real number is greater than or equal to zero, I could write it like this. Does it show up? Oh, there we go. Um, so for all x, x squared is greater than or equal to zero. Or you could say for any x, x squared is greater than or equal to zero. So you may use different words to express it for all or for any, they're interchangeable. So now let's try something non-mathematical. Every leopard has spots. How would you translate this statement using universal quantifier? Well, uh, we first need to have a variable, let's say x. What does x represent? In this context, x refers to any types of animals. And we want to say that for any x, if x is a leopard, then x has a spot. So at this point, we need two functions to refer to leopard and spots. So how about letting Capital L of X mean X is a leopard and capital S of X mean X having spots. Then we have an implication for any X. If X is a leopard, then X has spots. Does it make sense? Okay, let's try uh, to look at next, the next one. Universal uh, existential quantifier. So it's used for statements of the form, there is an object X having property P. For example, the equation uh, X has a real, uh, this equation has a, a real root, X squared plus two X plus one is zero. So we can emphasize that this is an existent statement by writing it in this form. There is a real number x, so it should x squared plus two x plus one is zero. Or you could write, uh, or you could say there exists a real number x. So it doesn't matter whether you write it as there is or there is, there exists. It is an existent statement. Let's try a different one. Some bird cannot fly. Uh, what does this statement suggest? Some birds cannot fly. So it suggests that there exists at least one type of bird who cannot fly. It's an existing statement. So how would you translate it into a symbolic logical form? Consider three things. What, what is the variable? What are the functions? And what do you want to express? So similar to the leopard uh, example, 
we can let uh, X represent any terms of animals. We want to say that there exists at least one X. If X is a bird, then X cannot fly. Here it is. So notice that in front of F of X, there is the negation sign, a dash with a little tail, meaning the opposite or the reverse of the truth value of a statement. Now, a real challenge for you. Lincoln had a well-known quote. You can find the quote in your handout on the first page. You may fool all of the people some of the time. You can even fool some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. How would you do this Sorry. one? For some bird cannot fly, it should be exist x, b of x, and not f of x, not implication. You could do that. I, yeah, I agree. You could do a conjunction, right? Yeah, I agree. Uh, that with implication, it's false because uh, this statement is true if they exist something that is not a bird. If, if X is bird, then this implication is true. So you have to use conjunction, not application. Uh, if it's an implication, we're saying if B of X is true, then not F of X is true. No, uh, Yuri is correct uh, because the implication is material conditional. So it's equivalent to saying not B of X or not F of X. So in that case, you could have that satisfied by having something that's not a, board, a not a bird or something that doesn't fly. So yeah, it, the conjunction would be the correct uh, operation. Okay, let me let me check let me check all that, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, I'll think about it. Um, so the last a challenge for uh, Lincoln's Lincoln's quote. Uh, here's a hint for you. If let f of pt mean that you can fold person p at time t, then how would you translate that statement or that quote? I'll give you a minute to think about it, and then I'll show the answer. Are you ready? Okay, here it is. Not showing here. Um, how did you do? Uh, we we don't quite have time to analyze this one, uh, but I'm I'm happy to chat about these quantifiers and how to translate uh, a plain language into uh, logical symbol forms. Uh, at the end of the chat. So at this point, uh, check maybe check your answer with this one and then see the, the differences and similarity and then we can chat about that later on. Uh, now it's time to move on to the next section, piano axioms. Let's welcome Jacqueline to lead. Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kitty. Let me share my screen. Okay, so before we uh, review the piano's axioms, let's have a look at the natural numbers. So the first, uh, the choice of the first natural number is actually arbitrary, and it really depends on the context how uh, mathematicians want to choose the first natural number, whether it's zero or one, but we'll be following the convention of considering zero as the first natural number. Now, we all know that natural numbers, they form the basis of number system. So we have natural numbers, then we have integers, uh, further, we have rational numbers and then real numbers. So does that mean that natural numbers are fundamental? Now to review that, try describing the natural numbers without mentioning the properties of numbers. Now that sounds interesting and that, that's exactly what uh, Piano did with his axioms. Now 
that now that we are reviewing the piano's axioms, what does an actually what does an axiom actually mean? An axiom is a statement that is taken to be true without needing any proof, and uh, it's considered as the starting point for further reasoning and arguments. Piano's axioms were published in 1889 by Joseph Piano, and uh, there are nine axioms of arithmetic, including four axioms of equality and uh, five axioms of number theory. You will find all these axioms in the handout that has been provided to you, and uh, we'll only be reviewing the five axioms of number theory today. So before we review them, each of them individually, let's have a look at all of them together. I just wanna move that so that you guys can see it completely. I hope it's better. Uh, so first axiom being zero is a natural number. And interestingly, you know what, when uh, Piano came up with his axioms, he considered one as the first natural number, because at that time there was a debate going on around whether zero is to be considered as a number or not. But um, all the modern formulations of Piano axioms consider zero as the first natural number. And that is because uh, zero is the additive identity in arithmetic. Uh, the second axiom being every natural number has a successor in the natural numbers. Third axiom states zero is not the successor of any natural number. Fourth is actually the principle of injection. And it states uh, the successors of two natural numbers are same if and only if the two original numbers are the same. Fifth piano's axioms of number theory is the principle of induction. And it states that if a set contains zero and the successor of every number is in the set, then the set contains the natural numbers. Let's review them individually. Now, what we're trying to do here is, and what Piano did was, we're trying to construct a set N, which is a set of natural numbers, without actually talking about the numbers or without referring to the properties of numbers. So let's see how we can do that. Now, the first thing is, because we're trying to construct a set, we know that we want the set to be non-empty. So let, us, let there be any element, which we are actually denoting by Z here, belong to that set. So it asserts the existence of at least one member of the set N. Now we all know that this Z is actually zero, but uh, remember, we just discussed, we're not going to talk about numbers, but we are still trying to construct the set. So let's see how that goes. So let Z be an N. Now to construct the set further, we want more elements. How do we do that? So just keep including the next element, and this brings the need for axiom two. Uh, every natural number has a successor in the natural numbers. So that's how we write it mathematically. Uh, so every n in, n in the set n, s of n is also in the set n. So that means that the set n is closed under function s, where s is the successor function. And successor function means it's giving you the next element to n. That would be n plus one. So we can also write it this way. But what if S of Z is equal to Z. Now, these are the only two elements we have so far. And if I say that these two elements are same because it doesn't state anywhere that they have to be unequal, what happens? Does it look like the set of natural numbers? It won't, right? Because it just has one element in that case. So here comes the need for the third axiom, which states zero is not the successor of any natural number. So for every N in the set N, successor of N is not equal to Z, where S denotes successor function. Now let's see what we have so far. So first axiom gave us the element Z belonging to N. The second axiom said that there is a successor function on Z, so S of Z, that also belongs to the set N. And then the third axiom says that these two elements are not equal. Now consider the successor of S of Z. So that would belong to N by the second axiom and that will not be equal to Z by the third axiom. But what if S of S of Z equals S of Z? Does that look like the set of natural numbers? Again, that won't because that would give us just two elements. So I gotta move this. So there will only be two elements in N then which are Z and S of Z. So this brings the need of axiom four, which is axiom of injection, which states that for all elements M and N belonging to the set N, M equals N if and only if successor of M equals successor of N. And that, that means that S is an injection. So 
S of S of Z is not equal to S of Z. Why? Because we already have that Z is not equal to S of Z, right? So now what do we have? So we have the elements Z, S of Z, S of S of Z and N, and we noticed that all of them are not equal to each other. So you see, we got a string of elements. So if we just keep on continuing infinitely like this, we have a string of all these successors. So using the four axioms, we can now identify N with the set of our natural numbers and we get zero, one, two, three, and so on. So does that mean it's enough? There's more to it. Let's have a look at this example. So consider the following example and check if the four axioms are satisfied. So we have the string of numbers zero, one, two, three, and so on. And then we have another loop with an apple and an orange and uh, orange is a successor of apple and apple is, an, is a successor of orange. So there is a Z, yes, we see zero. Every element has a successor in the set. So second axiom holds true. Let's look at the third one. Zero is not a successor of any element. Yep, that holds true too. And then fourth axiom, no two elements have the same successor. Does that mean this is the set of natural numbers? Numbers from zero, one, two, and so on, and then an apple and an orange. So we don't want these random elements in fact, any random elements to be natural numbers, right? Also, if you look at the first four axioms, it's not specific to just natural numbers because the next element, it's not very clear. So here, these, uh, these axioms would also hold true for positive real numbers. So what do we do in this case, just to be more specific about natural numbers? So here comes the need for the fifth axiom, which is called the axiom of induction. So if M is a subset of N, such that Z belongs to M and for any element belonging to M, the successor also belongs to M, then we say this set N it will be contained in M, which means that such a set N is the minimal set that satisfies the previous axioms. So by axiom five, we now get zero, one, two, three, four, and so on is the set of natural numbers because that string itself satisfied all the conditions and that was the minimal set. We didn't need apple and oranges along with that. Okay, so I'll pass on the stage to Logan now. Okay, so now we've done some practice of logical reasoning and we've done some practice with sort of axiomatic definitions of natural numbers. Now, before we sort of show you the natural number game in Lean, I want to spend a bit more time talking about those instructions of a proof that I talked about earlier. Um, now, these are called tactics, and like I said, they're instructions on how to complete a proof. Um, if you, uh, Jacqueline, just click on the slide. Yeah. Oh, too far. Yeah, so here uh, I've highlighted the specific tactics that are used in this proof. So we have three lines here between the begin and end block. And in each line we have a tactic. So use, apply, and simp are all tactics. Uh, and and uh, sometimes tactics take arguments, like, like a function takes arguments. So the argument to the first one is n over two, the argument to the second one is this you know, long uh, name of a, of, a, of a proof term. Uh, and the argument, the last one is, is uh, the premise H. Uh, and each, each tactic is separated by, by a comma. And that, that's important because if you play the natural number game, what you'll be doing is filling in exactly these tactics. Uh, so I'll spend a bit of time talking about the two important ones to get you started. The first one is the reflexivity tactic, which is used to close a, a goal or a proof of the form P equals Q, uh, where lean can kind of reduce P and Q to the same value. Now, what it means to reduce here is, is not always clear. Um, uh, for instance, this is an example of a goal that can be, can be closed by reflexivity when you just have one plus one plus one equals three, because Lean knows how to reduce these to the same um, uh, value uh, according to their definitions. Um, but sometimes you might get sort of things that you think would reduce that don't. So you might have something like uh, n plus zero equal to n, which reduces uh, with reflexivity, and that's fine. Um, but you wouldn't have zero plus n is equal to n. So one would follow from its definition and one has to be proved. Uh, so for that reason, you might sometimes not be able to prove everything you think would be reflexive using this tactic, but it's still an important one to use. Um, the next one is a very important tactic called rewrite. Uh, and when you reuse this one, you just write RW. Um, and it's used to use uh, to rewrite equations using either other equalities or uh, logical equivalences. So here I've put uh, an example of a proof script that uses rewrite twice. Um, so I've just pasted in as a comment the, the goal state at each point along the proof. 
So I started out with this uh, equation, A plus B plus C equals B plus C plus D. And then I rewrite using my hypothesis H1, which at the start of the proof, you see that says A equals B. So when I say rewrite H1, it's going to look for occurrences of A in the goal and replace it with occurrences of B. Uh, so in the first case, uh, it, it finds the occurrence of A at the far left-hand side of the equality and replaces it with B. Now, every rewrite has a direction associated with it. Um, by default, the association is from left to right. So you look for things on the left-hand side of the equation and replace it with the right-hand side. Um, but I can also specify to do it the other way. So I can put this little arrow symbol um, and that will tell uh, the system to, in this case, so it's rewriting from right to left using H2. H2 says that uh, C is equal to D. So now instead of looking for occurrences of C, it's going to look for occurrences of D and then replace it with C. Uh, and so you can see that it does exactly that with the uh, instance of D at the far right hand side of the goal. Okay, so now we're going to show you the natural number game. So uh, Kevin Buzzard, whose picture I showed uh, earlier in the slideshow, um, developed this game with, with some collaborators. Um, uh, it's basically a way for you to work with proofs about natural numbers using the kind of axiomatic definitions that, that Jacqueline was talking about um, and sort of get, get you to learn how to use lean to prove simple theorems. Um, so there's 10 worlds that start out with very basic theorems and then go on to you know, more, more complex things. Uh, and and yeah, it's 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 not using all of lean. It's not an exhaustive definition of what lean is used for, but it's a really good introduction, I think. Um, and so I think I will just uh, I'll put the link to the game uh, in the chat, and then I'll show you sort of what the getting started in the game looks like. Um, okay, Logan, you do that. I was going to do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, there is. I noticed there's one question. How uh, from CCN, uh, how would one insert that symbol quickly? I was oh. type and uh, Logan, you can um, uh, stop typing. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's just um, uh, the backslash and then L in, in most uh, text editors that have a, a lean, lean support. Um, I can try and demonstrate. Yeah, yeah. That um, if you want to okay. go to the other one, it's uh, backslash R. Right yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Uh, just to show that that will be uh, more visual for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the home page of the natural number game. Uh, so there's an explanation of what the game is about uh, and some uh, acknowledgments, and then on the right is sort of all the different worlds that you can go to. So you can go to any world in any order, but of course it's meant to be played sort of from from top to bottom. So I can go to the tutorial world, and there here. You know, Kevin will explain to me how reflexivity works, but I just explain that to you, and you can read this on, on your own later. Um, but at, at the bottom, it has a, a theorem statement and then a proof where you're meant to fill in some tactics. Um, so in my case, I can go here, uh, and then I see that I have a goal to be proved in the top right-hand corner. Uh, I can see um, that this is something that can be proved with reflexivity, so I put the REFL tactic with a comma, uh, the comma is very important to tell Lean to process this as one tactic. And then I see that the proof is complete. Um, if I go to the next level up here, uh, I now get to try it using the rewrite tactic. And yeah, so I'll try that here by using rewrite for this hypothesis eight. And so if I don't provide a direction instruction, it's just going to look for occurrences of Y and replace it with X plus Z. And if I look at my goal, that's exactly what I want, because if I can get this y to be x plus z, or sorry, x plus 7, not z, um, then I can close this with reflexivity. So I'll try that. And then I should be able to use reflexivity. So like Katie was mentioning before, you can do backslash l, and that will uh, convert into the reverse direction uh, symbol for the rewrite tactic. Um, but in this case, yeah, so in this case, I can do the same thing um, because I can, just as I substituted y for x plus 7, I could substitute x plus 7 for y. Uh, and that gives me something that I can also prove using reflexivity. So in this case, both directions are, are just as valid for the proof. Uh, and I can proceed. So there's two more levels in the tutorial world before you get into the real meat of it. Um, but as you can see here, you get into learning more about Piano's axioms, which Chaplin just told us about. 
Um, and then you start to sort of prove more interesting things about natural numbers. And this is the, the bulk of, of the game. And like I said, it's, it's meant to be sort of a, a gentler introduction to what it feels like to prove things uh, using, using lean. Thank you, Logan. Uh, so uh, I hope you now you have a better sense of how Lean works, and now you want to uh, get your hands dirty uh, to try a few proofs in the tutorial world. So if you uh, open the link, uh, click on you. All your knots going to be blue, blue, right? Going to be blue. Once you finish, it turns green, and then you can go to next level. The goal is to get them all green, of course. Uh, so we can start, we have like eight, nine minutes or so. Uh, so you can start with uh, a tutorial world. There are four levels. I'm pretty sure you can complete that, that the entire world in the next eight minutes. And raise your hand, we're here to help while you're doing the proof, which tactics and why it doesn't work. Maybe you you, uh, you forgot the comma, you know, little things like that. Just uh, put your questions in chat. Uh, we're here to help. Uh, you can start the tutorial work. Hopefully you can finish uh, by the time we finish. Uh, have a question. Oh. Oh yeah, someone, okay, that's fine. Yeah, uh, put the question there. I will start the music again, so you feel relaxed. Oh, there was a there was another question. Um, someone asked if it's possible to uh, take lean proofs and generate uh, human readable proofs. Um, okay. That that would be that would be really cool. Uh, not not in general and not automatically. Um, uh, there are some things that you can do. You can write uh, these sort of meta programs that that can sort of analyze uh, lean terms, uh, or, or I guess even even proofs. And uh, yeah, you're saying there's some work towards this, but it probably won't be done with lean three, uh, the current sort of mainstream version of lean. Um, I, I showed I showed in one of the, uh, the, the uh, U of T St. George seminars, um, Mar Mario Carnero wrote a, a tactic that converts lean proofs to uh, another proof format that uh, is, is sort of, Close to what a Fitch style proof kind of looks like, but it's it's not human readable, really. But that would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you use this uh, pound key explode, right? That's what you did. You demonstrate last time. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we don't need to get to that because there's no practical reason to do it, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. And start the game and put questions in the chat. We're here to help. Uh, let's work on that for another six minutes.
Okay, I think uh, it's time to wrap up. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit uh, where you're at. Uh, anyone, anyone finished the tutorial world, the four levels? Anyone? I bet someone did. <laughs> nope, nobody's saying anything. I'm still in the, oh, that's fine, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is this is why you should come back next Monday because we're gonna work together on addition and multiplication world together, and of of course before that we will show you the tactics that you need you you uh, you need to know to solve the uh, to tackle the proofs, and also we have. Uh, we need some time to revisit the uh, natural number at uh, the, I mean, the log logical uh, puzzle, because we don't have time to analyze it. However, I will tell you the solution. So Alice's uh, brother is the victim and her husband is the killer. So you can spend some time figure it out. We'll talk about it. Uh, next Monday. That's the first thing we're going to do. Then we'll do more uh, uh, games on the, in the natural number game. Uh, just want to remind you session two is on November. No, session two is on. No, on December 1st. December 1st, right. That's next Wednesday, same time. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so I uh, hope to see all of you uh, next Monday. And if you have questions, you can uh, hang out here a little longer. We're here to help. Let's thank the speakers. Thank you. <laughs>a survey so please oh. fill that please fill that in i'll stop i'll stop the recording and i will 